All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to today's uh, session of the New York uh, uh, Group Series Seminar. So before I introduce today's speaker, let me mention a couple of things. Uh, so uh, the recording of last week's talk uh, uh, is available uh, at the uh, seminar webpage. Uh, so, and uh, also the information about upcoming talks uh, is available there as well. Uh, this will, uh, currently, we have two more talks scheduled. Uh, next week, it's uh, uh, Emily Stark, and uh, the week after that, uh, it's Benson Farb, and I think that will probably be there for the semester. So, if you um, uh, if you would like to be added to the New York Group Series Seminar mailing list, please send me an email. So, and that way you will get the announcement automatically and not uh, have to ask me. And also, those people who are joining episodically, please uh, send me these emails asking for the uh, Zoom info, I don't know, like at least 30 minutes, uh, you know, or an hour in advance, don't, uh, <laughs> because I'm getting a slew of these emails in the last minute, and it's difficult to, to manage them when I have to announce the speaker. Uh, one last thing uh, that I wanted to mention before uh, I hand, hand the microphone to Alexander is that, uh, so as usual, uh, once the talk starts, please Put, uh, put yourself on mute. So that's the button in the lower left corner of your Zoom menu. And when and if you want to ask a question, so then unmute yourself and ask a question. That's our protocol. So with that said, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker. It's uh, Alexander Hulke from uh, Colorado State University. And he's going to tell us something about index computations in arithmetic groups. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you're all doing reasonably okay given the circumstances. I see a lot of names where I know and a lot of names whom I don't yet know and I hope in the not too far future there will be an opportunity to actually meet you all in person again. Right, so what I want to talk about is work I've done um, on index computations. Um, this is, let me say actually, yeah, oh, the mouse, can, can you, I guess there you should be able to also see the mouse cursor, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm grateful to NSF, which has been partially sponsoring this work. Often people have an NSF logo picture. Well, I'm very proud to have a really nice picture with an NSF logo on, uh, but even more important, this is joint work with Alade Tinko, who now is in Hull in the UK, and Dane Flannery, who is in Galway in Ireland. Um, this is something which exists in an archive preprint. This is a paper which currently is undergoing revisions and hopefully will be published in the not so far future. Um, yeah, so a lot of, in some way, one of the core properties or core competencies of mathematics is to build connections and arithmetic groups are one area which has a lot of connections within mathematics. So an al al arithmetic groups are algebra in some way algebraic groups given defined over a ring of integers. So there are connections to algebraic geometry, there are connections to number theory, obviously connection to group theory. And since I'm a group theorist, I'm in particular care about the group theory connections and the aspects I will be talking about is connections to matrix groups, to finitely presented groups. And what is particularly interesting is the interplay between the finitely presented world and the matrix world. Um, yeah, in some way what I, we are doing, one could say, is we want to use algorithms we have for finite groups and apply them for certain kinds of infinite groups. Um, well, you'll see how, how well this, this work works or does, does not work. So what is the setup? I start with an arithmetic group. Uh, so there we formally, we have a group which is uh, defined group of matrices defined by polynomials on the matrix entries. Um, but typically for what we're doing, really the groups are SLN 
or SP, the symplectic group given over the integers. And that's really all one needs for this talk. And that's where we've done our work. Um, we take a subgroup finitely generated, generated by a couple of matrices in say SLNZ. And the question is, is this sub, does this subgroup have finite index? And if it has finite index, what is the index? Can we calculate it? And one interesting relation is that finite, this is a theorem which I'm not going to prove here, but finite index in an arithmetic group means that the group is again itself arithmetic. So it's a, it's a nice class of groups which is closed under undertaking finite index subgroups. Well, the big caveat to start with is there cannot be a general algorithm. It has been shown, and this is again by translating the Halter problem for Turing machines um, to the situation that there cannot be a algorithm which would be deterministically in time which can be bounded a priori decide whether a subgroup has finite index or not. And well, one can lament this, but the fact that there can't be a general algorithm doesn't mean that we will still be able to get solutions in particular cases. And that's basically what this talk is about. So I mentioned we have multiple representations of groups. So we will look at the groups. And again, for gamma, imagine S, L, N, Z, N by N matrices with determinant one and integer entries. Um, we can consider this as a group of matrices. And at the same time, we can consider it as a finitely presented group. And the representations, the two different representations, matrix group and finitely presented group, they interplay in the algorithms. So for this, of course, we need to be able to translate between these two representations. So we have matrices, so we need the presentation also in certain, and we need to know in which particular matrix generators the presentation is given. And such presentations, they go back probably for SL to Chevalet or even earlier. For the symplectic groups, there is work by Klingen and by Berman. That's particular is a very nice paper from 71, where she gives a concrete presentation for the symplectic group and gives the matrices the abstract generators corresponds to. Next, to translate from finitely presented group to matrix group and vice versa, we need some way for doing this. Well, from the finitely presented group to the matrix group, that is very easy. That's just evaluating words in the generators. Um, vice versa, that's a little bit harder because there we need to, we have a matrix and we need to write the matrix as a product of the generating matrices. In the case of GL or SL, that is relatively easy because the nice generators are elementary matrices. And that's something we've all learned in our first linear algebra class how to do. That's well, the fancy name is Hermit normal form or it's, it's Gaussian elimination. But there is a slight problem with this and that's the word length. If I take the standard algorithms for calculating, say, or meet normal form, or bringing a matrix into RREF, and I look at the word expression I get when writing this matrix as a word in the elementary matrices, this expression gets very long. And the reason is not very surprising. The reason is that Let's say in your matrix, you have entry one here, you have underneath entry 10,000. What does your algorithm do? It will clean out the 10,000 with the one by subtracting 
the first row 10,000 times from the second row. But what does this mean for words? It means that I'm dividing off the 10,000th power of an elementary matrix. That makes the words long. So therefore, Hermit normal form alone doesn't work that well, but what works much better is to use a norm-based reduction. I have a paper about this in the ISAC proceedings from two years ago, um, which uses similar tools to some other normal form algorithms where we don't just reduce systematically column by column or row by row, but we try to reduce while keeping the norms of the matrices small. And that actually works reasonably to give short, shortish expressions as words for, for the matrices. So this works well enough for our purposes. Okay, so that's the two representations, the way to go between the representations. So what's the first step? The first step is density and finding primes. So if we have matrices over the integers, we can reduce modulo some number, say you reduce modulo a prime, and get matrices modulo that prime. And because we or our matrices have determinant one, the result will be invertible modulo that prime. So we get a homomorphism from our group, say SLNZ, to uh, the corresponding group, say SLNP, for the field over the field with P elements or over the residue class ring integers modulo M. And now the fundamental theorem for these groups is um, the following translation, which is quite a deep theorem. It has, there are I'm aware of two separate proofs. There is a more geometric version by Matthews, Wasserstein, and Weisfeiler from 84. There is also a proof by Weigel in two papers from 95 and 96, which is more groups of lead type flavor. And that says the following. If we have a subgroup, there are three properties which are equivalent. The first property is if I, there exists a prime that if I reduce modulo that prime, I get the full image. So my subgroup modulo some particular prime will be SLNP. The second property is it holds for all but finitely many primes. So there are just finitely many exceptions. And the third property is the subgroup is dense in the Zariski topology. The Zariski topology is what your colleagues in algebraic geometry love to do. Of course, as a group theorist, I'm far more comfortable with reduction modulo a prime. So I really like this result because it translates a topological property which I yes can understand what it means, but don't have a good feeling with feeling up for to a really nice algebraic property reduction modulo almost all primes is the full group and if this is the case um for a subgroup the subgroup is called dense as being zariski dense if a subgroup has finite index in an arithmetic group if it is arithmetic it must be zariski dense so all the sub the first thing we need is to see that the subgroup is dense. Small caveat aside, arithmetic and dense are not the same. Arithmetic implies dense, dense does not imply arithmetic. There are subgroups, there are groups which are not arithmetic but are dense, and such groups are called thin, and they are quite prominent at the moment in mathematics, but they're also a little bit like dark energy in physics. There are lots of them, but it's really hard to find them or to identify that such a group has this property. So in one of the recent issues of the AMS notices, there is an article by uh, Alan Reed and some co-authors, which is called, What is a Thin Group? 
and they describe these properties and their article ends with a example which looks completely harmless and they ask is this group thin or not and they say nobody knows and yes i've tried some calculations but i have no way no idea how one could prove it and i'm not sure whether anyone has an idea how one could prove this so what i or what what we will be doing is rather the opposite we will be showing that some groups are not thin okay Right, so what I learned or what I was told by colleagues who run an online seminar for a longer time is that one should stop about every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and these, I have a few of these slides in between which are basically just there to briefly stop and offer the opportunity for questions or comments. Um, also, basically, what I have in this white box here, that's all what you need to remember from the stuff before. Uh, so if you felt lost, don't worry, we'll, we'll start again and with, with something slightly different and you don't, won't have to be, won't have continued to be lost. Okay, so that doesn't seem to be the question, but please don't be shy in interrupting. Please don't be shy in asking. Oh, good. Okay, Susan seems to be okay. Thank you, Susan. Um, good. So, um, oh, because I clicked. So, the first thing I want to do is, and this is implicitly also a test for density. I want to find out, given a subgroup, how do I test that it is dense? How do I find the primes for which reduction modulo P is not subjective? So as far as density tests go, first there is a probabilistic density test by Igor Rivin. This is in an archive article a few years ago. That does not just only tests whether the subgroup is dense, but it does not find the primes modulo which the, the reduction is not subjective. Also, it is probabilistic in that it can guarantee that the subgroup is dense, but if it is not dense, um, it basically just does a guess. Right, the next possibility how one can test this is by taking the adjoint representation. So the adjoint representation is, um, would be for matrices, the representation by act, as acting by conjugation on the space of matrices for SL or for the symplectic group acting on symmetric matrices by conjugation. So this representation is in a larger dimension and if the adjoint representation is absolutely irreducible, then the group must be the full SL or the full SP. What we could do is we could construct the adjoint representation over Z on the generators. And now to test for the primes modulo which it is absolutely irreducible, what we can use is the theorem from basic representation theory, which says, a representation is absolutely irreducible if and only if the matrices in the matrix images of the group elements span the full matrix ring or the full matrix vector space. So we take matrices in the group, take their products, random products, look at what the matrices, and look what the matrices span, that is a Z lattice, we can calculate this till the Z lattice has full rank, calculate the discriminant of the lattice, and the primes dividing the discriminants are exactly the primes modulo which this lattice has not full rank. So these are the candidates for the primes modulo which the representation uh, would, could, might be not absolutely irreducible. That's a nice theoretical property. It has a practical problem. And the practical problem is, if I start at a particular dimension, first taking the adjoint representation roughly squares the dimension. 
And then if I take the space of matrices in a party, that again squares the dimension because the matrix space of n by n matrices has dimension n square. So I would actually go to dimension n to the four. And even if I start with something quite small, if I start in dimension four, um, four to the four is 256. So that grows quite quickly. And at that point, these discriminant calculation and lattice calculations get quite expensive. So in practice, this does not work well. So what we are doing is a different method where we basically look at pseudo-random matrices, so just pseudo-random products of the generators, and we want to test whether the image modulo sum p might, is, might lie in some maximal subgroup because in these cases, we know, uh, well, if that is not the case, then the image must be the full full group. And in all of this, of course, it's sufficient to find a superset of the interesting primes because we can just check for all the primes whether the image is really different from the full group. So the next thing I want to do is to show you how we do tests just on single pseudo-random elements to test whether, a sub, whether the image might lie in a certain maximal subgroup. Yeah, and that is described in a paper we have in MathComp 2018. So if the image of a group subgroup is not the full group, this is a finite group, so then the image must lie in a maximal subgroup. And the maximal subgroups of SL or SP, they are typically defined geometrically. This is the famous Aschbacher classification. And what we do is we look at the different Aschbacher classes that could arise. And for each of these classes, we get some condition, typically divisors of a number. And this number you can imagine as a value that we have something which would be an invariant polynomial, invariant in the sense of invariant theory for the maximal subgroup. We evaluate this on our element, but we evaluate it in characteristic zero, so it gives us an integer, but we want the primes modulo which this could become zero. So the interesting primes are simply those which are the divisors of that number. And that might initially look horrible that we would get lots of primes, but we can take multiple elements. And if we do this a couple of times and we only look at the primes which divide all of these numbers, typically we end up very quickly after a few tests with just a few small number of primes. So let me just briefly look at a few of these Aschbacher classes. So these are our classes of maximal subgroups, say of SL. What can happen? It could be subgroups which are reducible. In this case, the natural representation is not absolutely irreducible. And I do a similar argument with, as with the discriminant as I described before for testing for this. But here we don't have the second squaring, so that actually works reasonably well. The next, though this isn't really an Aschbacher class, but something one can use for dealing in particular dimensions with certain Aschbacher classes, if the orders are absolutely bounded. If the orders of the images of the maximal subgroups are, are absolutely bounded, then also the exponents of the groups are absolutely bounded. So in this case, we take a pseudo random element H. And then what we would need is that if we take the image of that, this element, we take the eth power that has to be the identity. So the eth power minus one has to be zero. That means if I take the original matrix, take the eth power, subtract one, um, that matrix modulo P must be zero. So P must divide the GCD of the entries of this matrix. That finds us the primes modulo which 
the image would be in this bounded order class. For subgroups which are monomial, then the subgroup, the maximal subgroup would be uh, would be basically multiplicative group of the field wreath Sn. In this case, we take the exponent of Sn, and this n is the dimension. Sn is it's always the same n. It's the matrix dimension. We take the exponent of Sn. If we take the eth power of that element, the image will not lie in Sn, but will lie in the n-fold direct product of F star of the multiplicative group with itself. So if we take two elements, their eth powers must commute. So our polynomial is commutator of two eth powers minus one. For tensor products, we get that the coefficients of a characteristic polynomial must satisfy a syzygy condition, for example. And then there are further classes. I'm not going through all of them, but for a lot of these classes, we have such descriptions, which finds us the primes. Um, there is a remaining case, and that's in the Aschbacher classification, the everything else case, and that's almost simple groups. They are not geometrically defined. And there, what we've done so far is that in small dimensions, they're actually bounded by, by an absolute order. So these are cases, say, A6 happens to be a maximal subgroup of SL3P for a certain primes for some congruence condition. That's the kind of subgroup, but then it's always A6, and that is bounded absolutely in size. Otherwise, if that is not the case, then we really need to go back to the test of the adjoint representation. Here, we hope at some point to find a better solution what we are doing is, however, because the adjoint representation is messy um, and is large, we are not using the lattice, but we're using a meat x space test. Very roughly, what we're doing is that we run the meat x over the integers and we keep track for which primes the calculation we did actually would fail that's basically collecting the primes modulo which some of the occurring matrices would not be invertible. And that's how we can find the primes. So now we have a finite set. We have tested that the subgroup is dense, the subgroup given by the matrices, and we have find, found the set of primes modulo which the image is not the full, say, SL. Next, we calculate what if the index is finite would be the index we calculate the index of the closure and the level of the, the closure so the arithmetic closure of a subgroup is the smallest arithmetic group containing oh this shouldn't have been a g this should have been an h and this should have been an h i'm sorry um and this is not completely obvious. This is a theorem that such a closure exists. Um, but that closure is arithmetic. It has finite index. Now, if the dimension is three or bigger, there is a very important property of these groups, which is called the congruent subgroup property. Any subgroup of finite index must contain a congruence kernel, the kernel of a reduction modulo some number. The smallest number for which this holds is called the level, and I will call this L. Okay. Now, what we do is, um, I will, to shorten notation, I will denote by BM, the index of, of the image in the corresponding group, the index, the, the index if I reduce modulo m. Because the subgroup, the closure C, contains the kernel of the reduction modulo L, if I calculate the index modulo L, 
I get the same index. That's the homomorphism theorem or second uh, isomorphism theorem or something like that. Well, and now we prove a theorem. And this theorem says two things. The first part is the prime divisors of this level are exactly the primes modulo which the image is not the full group. So that's exactly the primes we've calculated the previous step. And the second property is that if the index stays the same, if I change the modulus by a factor of a particular prime, then the index will always stay the prime same even if I multiply by further factors of the prime. So this second step gives us a way for calculating the level and the index because what we do is basically we calculate the index modulo some number. We then make the number larger by one of the primes where we are interested in and we check does the index grow larger. If yes, we continue with this prime. If not, then not. And when we, we will reach a stage where if we multiply M with any of the possible primes, the index always stays the same, then this theorem proves that we found the correct index and also the and M is the correct level. And for the dimensions where we've tried it, which is, which is dimension up to eight, this works reasonably quick. Uh, one second, sorry, can I ask a couple of questions here? Yes, of course. Uh, so this is a little too far from me, so maybe my questions will be stupid, but I'll ask anyway. Um, so this arithmetic closure uh, uh, as an algorithmic problem, so uh, given uh, given uh, given H, uh, uh, is it actually computable? So where if H is, uh, I don't know, a subgroup of uh, something like SLN or SP something uh, given by generators, uh, uh, I mean, can, can we compute this? Uh, yes, well, yeah, we can. yes. basically can. what we are doing, what our algorithm effectively does is it computes the arithmetic closure. Uh, I see, uh, because uh, I also assume uh, uh, that uh, it should be undecidable maybe, except for maybe small dimensions, whether or not uh, uh, H itself already has finite index, right? Yes, yeah, that is undecidable. But, uh, I mean, there are probably some kind of standard reasons uh, uh, for, for why almost everything is undecidable and that's also undecidable, right? Yes, I yes. See. Okay, and uh, uh, what about the problem of being, uh, um, what, what did you call it, dense? Uh, so is that uh, decidable or undecidable as an algorithm? Yes, dense is, dense is decidable because what you would do is you, t you just need to check that the adjoint representation, that the matrices in the adjoint representation span uh, lattice of full rank. And that's something you can compute. It's just a bigger, bigger dimension calculation. Oh, uh, just a moment. I see. And that's an if and only if condition, right? And that's an if and only if, yes. Oh, Dense see. is okay. testable. Uh, okay. Okay, arithmetic is and not, and that's not. why this thin, these thin groups are are these mm -hmm. uh, mysterious things because they have the dense property. We can the one part of the property one can test well dense, but the arithmetic, the other part one, there is no algorithm really for testing it. Okay, thank you. And in particular, no algorithm for testing the interesting part. We can, uh, the methods which exist, and what I'm telling you here is one kind of methods can show that a group is not thin, but we in general cannot prove that a group is, is thin. Okay. Um, yeah, there is small, let me um, mention, oh, I need to go in the other window. Um, Small caveat, so this theorem actually, it's not completely true if for prime two and the dimension is two or three, we need to be slightly careful there. We need to also try reduction modulo four. Um, for the proof of this theorem, actually there is 
the proof for basically all of it for SL already exists by Weisigel in 1977 and by Weigel in 95 for more generally groups of Lie type. What the proof does is basically showing that congruence kernels do not have supplements in say SLN integers modulo M or SPN for even N integers modulo M. The congruence kernel, the kernel when reducing modulo divisor modulo M, these kernels never have supplements. And from that, this property about indices, once they don't grow, the indices can't grow in one step, they never later for the same prime can grow. From that, it follows. Um, and what we did is to, well, prove the translation to our property, which is not hard. And both Weigel and Beisiegel have small exceptions where their methods did not apply. And we are proving it also for, for these exceptions, for these small dimensions where they couldn't do it. OK. So, um, yeah, now to calculate these indices BM, we need to calculate in a matrix group o in, over the integers modulo M. How do we do this? Well, first, some way all of this is not very surprising. If M is a product of prime, different prime powers, we had taken take a product well, this should have said subdirect product for the prime different prime powers, so we can combine this. Now, for every prime, we can just look, it's sufficient to look at a single prime power. We take the composition tree modulo P, presentation for the kernel, for the image modulo P, which we get from the composition tree, gives kernel generators, and then the group modulo P to some power, we get the group modulo P on the top, and then we get layers, which are basically kernel modulo P to the A, modulo kernel modulo P to the A plus one, such layers one by one underneath. These layers, the elements have the form identity plus some power of P times some matrix. And then these matrices of this type, basically of, of this kind of type, they mul if you have two such matrices, they multiply by just adding these A parts here together. So then it's just linear algebra on matrices. And that's how we can calculate with these groups, calculate the orders of these groups. The somewhat surprising obstacle is element arithmetic. And that's because typically, Computer algebra systems have quick algorithms built in for working with matrices modulo P. They do not have good algorithms built in for working modulo composite M, and that makes the element arithmetic slow. Okay, yeah, all of this is implemented. In GAP, there is a package called MetGroup. And there is also code for the further calculations with the arithmetic groups, which is on GitHub. It's a, if you search for my name on GitHub, there is a package called arithmetic, which has this code in. Let me briefly show you in an example what it can do. So this is a group here, which is not completely random, but is of course a constructed example so that things happen nicely, but you see it's a group with matrices where the numbers are big enough that, that it looks a horrible mess. We calculate for which primes is the image not the full SLNP. And this goes through these different classes, does the tests, and it finds these are the primes for which it could happen. And then we are using these primes and we are calculating the index of the closure using that these are the primes and it calculates, tries powers of the primes, and after about 15 seconds, it finds this horrendous index, and it finds the level. The level is 30,210, and the index is, uh, index is this horrible product of prime powers. Um, and that's the index of the closure. Okay, and that is my second brief pause for questions.
Alexander, what language is the program written to do this? In GAP. In GAP. Uh, right, but in GAP, what language is it? What computer language is it? I mean, GAP is GAP has a setup similar to, to Maple, or so there is a kernel in C and that provides its own programming language. And uh -huh. so what yeah, I'm yeah. writing is, yeah. is in the GAP programming language. Um, if we would have started GAP now, we probably would have used Python or something. It's just that didn't exist in the, the 19, eight, late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh huh. But so, for example, if there is a program written in Python, can you like take it in GAP or it is not compatible with? Uh, it's a bit, I mean, GAP sits under Sage. And there one could try to make a, to put things together, but I think it would work if you have a relatively high level routine, but the translation could get quite costly if you have a low level routine. Uh -huh, I see, okay. And if you have if you have a concrete question with computing, by all means, ask me afterwards or send me an email, and I'm I'm happy to to look at to look at that. Mm -hmm. So, what we have so far is the index of the closure. Now, how can we prove that that is the index of the subgroup? For that, we go into the finitely presented world. So. We take the whole group as a finitely presented group and we attempt an index calculation with a coset enumeration. If the coset enumeration finishes, that's great. We've proven that the index is finite and everything is fine. And actually our previous calculation wouldn't have been needed, but often it doesn't finish. And then the previous calculation helps us because if the previous calculation tells us that the index of the closure is small, well, that does not prove that the subgroup really has infinite index, but it might indicate, at least indicates cases where, where something might be, might be more complicated. Or if our, the other case is the in calculation does not finish and the index is large, well, the index of the closure is already large. Then of course we know the calculation could not have finished because the index is so large. So what we do in such a case, and I should say small here for our purposes is roughly around 10 to the seven. If the index is large, we use the information of the arithmetic closure to find some subgroup which lies between our subgroup H and the full group. And good candidates for this are simply the group generated by taking the closure with some congruence kernel for a divisor of the level. This finds us an intermediate subgroup. We rewrite the presentation to that intermediate subgroup with Reitermeister Schreier and then attempt the index calculation there. And in some, in quite a number of cases, then this index calculation where the index is smaller than the coset enumeration works. Of course, the problem is if we rewrite, the size of the rewritten presentation grows roughly with the index. Tietze transformations can reduce, but only so far. So this is not a panacea, but works reasonably in a number of cases. So I now want to show you some examples where we've done this. And these are, these examples, they are called monodromy groups of hypergeometric equations. Please don't ask me about the underlying geometry, which is algebraic geometry, I do not understand. But as groups, they're not very hard to define. So we take two polynomials, of the same degree, even degree n, which are products of cyclotomic polynomials and are co-prime. And we take the companion matrices of these two polynomials and we take the group generated by these companion matrices. And such groups have been studied quite a bit, uh, starting with the work of Boykes and Heckman in 89. And then there is a paper by Singh and Venkatarama in 2014 
where they attempt to prove for where they well they prove for some of these groups that they are ar arithmetic for some they can't so Boykos and Heckman already show these groups we get, they are always dense in a symplectic group. And the question is which ones are arithmetic. And for example, there has been a paper by two algebraic geometers who have tried to prove this for just a few cases. It's about a 40 page paper where they prove it for just a handful of results. So for this, we've now applied our techniques, which I've described on the previous slides. But before this, let me just show you in an example. So I take two polynomials here, and please believe me, these are co two polynomials are co-prime. They are products of cyclotomic polynomials. I take the corresponding companion matrices here. Well, they lie in a symplectic group, but a problem is if I calculate the form which this group preserves, that's not the standard symplectic form. And the presentation where I need to have concrete matrices corresponding to, that presentation is for the standard symplectic group, for the standard symplectic form. So I need to do a base change to this form, which is meet X and linear algebra. It's not really hard to do, but, and in some way, if you calculate the determinant of the form, you see this already, this form does not have determinant one. So if I do the base change, I end up with a matrix which doesn't have integer entries any longer, but rational entries. So I need to calculate the intersection with the group over the integers. I do this basically as a stabilizer calculation and get Schreier generators. And there is a theorem which shows that um, the index of this intersection in gamma will be finite if and only if the index of the original group in this other symplectic group is finite. Yeah, so we've done this. We've done this in degree four. There are 111 groups in total. The work of Singh and Venkataramana calculated that 60 of them must be arithmetic. For these, we were able to calculate the indices. Not all of them were known before. There are 51 groups remaining we were able to prove that 23 of them are arithmetic because the coset enumeration finished. 26 had the enumeration fail. Two of them have index so large that the enumeration had to fail. So there we don't know. The other ones might be candidates for being thin. We also have been able to do this in degree six, but there the indices get larger. It gets overall harder quite quickly. Let me just briefly show you just how some cases of this. So we always have pairs of polynomials and we have say a case here where our coset enumeration finished. And if you look at the index, this is already a pretty large index and our coset enumeration still finished. And that was only possible by using these intermediate subgroups. So really the reduction modulo uh, calculating the level was was crucial for doing this. What I should mention, and this is something I just learned about last week, there is a paper on the archive by Bai Pai Singh and another Singh, where they look also at degree six, where they took our work and looked at it theoretically. They were able to prove some further things theoretically, but I didn't yet have the chance to compare their result and ours because they unfortunately give their groups in a very different parametrization. But I should mention that there is work building on this. Yes, and that's my third and last intermediate break. So we are, we have used the congruence images to to calculate indices, and this has been successful for some symplectic groups. So let me finish by looking at the opposite case. Can we prove that the index is infinite? And I just want to show you one method which in certain cases works. 
So coset enumeration, of course, cannot prove that an index is infinite. And recall, there cannot be a general method anyhow for proving infinite index because of impossibility results. But here is another attempt. Let's suppose we have a subgroup of finite index. And then we know that if this, our subgroup also has finite index, the intersection must have finite index. In particular, the intersection must have finite index in this subgroup U. Also suppose we have a homomorphism on U, which has infinite image. And we find in this image that the intersection has infinite index, then the original subgroup must have infinite index. This works, I think that only works in dimension two because of the congruent subgroup property from dimension three and larger. But let me finish with an example showing you infinite index in dimension two. So this is an example which was brought up by Bechler and Margolis in an email to me last year. They take, yes, they don't have SL, they have GL, but that's just an index two question here. That's not really a big issue. Um, and they take GL not over Z, but over a ring of integers with a third root of unity. Again, that makes things look more ugly, but isn't really a fundamental difference. So they give a subgroup generated by these six matrices here, and they ask, does this subgroup has finite index? I calculate congruence images and mod working modulo a couple of primes, so modulo the product of these primes, I get this huge index. So assumption is probably the index is not finite because there could be more primes. Or if the index is finite, it really is so large that it would be hopeless to try to do. But let's go to the presentation world. Luckily, there is a paper by Swan. Actually, there are two papers by Swan. And this is an advice to graduate students. Never do what he did. He wrote two papers which have exactly the same title. One is from 96, one is from 71. And it's a mess to find out which paper is which if people don't cite properly. So here I'm using the newer one, which is in advances in mathematics. He gives a presentation for GL2 Z 30 roots of unity. These matrices subject to these relations. If you look at the relations, it's not hard to see that we can eliminate U, J, and L as redundant generators. Um, and I've done this. Now I use the norm-based reduction, which I mentioned earlier, to find word expressions for these matrices. Well, coset enumeration fails, no surprise. The index is at least as large as this 30-digit number I showed you two slides ago. Coset enumeration would not be able to succeed on current machine or with that. But now I take a subgroup. I take the kernel of the reduction modulo 7. Then this subgroup reduction modulo 7 has as image the full GL27. So the index is the size of that subgroup is 2016. The image of my subgroup has order 24. So the intersection will give me a subgroup of index 24. I get Schreier generators. Well, and this subgroup U now has an infinite quotient, namely the abelianization, which I get via Smith normal form. So I use Reiter Meister Schreier to get a presentation for the subgroup. I get Smith normal form and I find the image of U the abelization of U is Z to the eight, infinite group. But if I calculate the image of the intersection in the abelianization, and I can do this with a transformation matrix of the Smith normal form, that image only has rank three, not rank eight. So it has infinite index. Therefore, this subgroup H must have infinite index. Yeah, alas, this does not work in dimensions bigger than two, I think. So let me close with some questions or open cases. 
There are a few situations for the primes where we don't yet have an answer. There are other classes of classical groups which could be interesting um, to look at and to prove similar theorems about non-supplements to apply similar methods there. What I would love to be able is to use the idea that I have that if the index is finite, I know already a group in which I can represent that index, in which I can represent the action on the cosets. Can I use that to drive or to help with the coset enumeration? I have no idea how to do so, but somehow it feels that is information which could be useful. And of course, but that would be the almost the holy grail. Are there any criteria for proving infinite index that would work in dimension bigger than two? I have no idea how to do this. Yeah, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, well, let's thank Alexander for a very interesting talk. Okay, so uh, now uh, if there are any questions uh, to the speakers, so feel free to ask them. So you can unmute yourself and ask a question. All right, if not, uh, so let's thank Alexander again. <laughs> um, I'll stop the recording now. Uh,